Well, hello and welcome uh, to this Michigan Notable Book Author Conversation. My name is Christine Byron, and I'm happy to serve on the Michigan Notable Selection Committee. And I have the pleasure of introducing Anne Marie Ullman, who is one of the 2023 Michigan Notable Book authors for her book, As Long As I Know You, The Mom Book. So welcome, Anne Marie. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And I also want to thank you and all of the um, members of that committee for the work that you do. It's a powerful gift to writers and readers throughout the state. And I am really and truly grateful and also grateful to you for just being such a loyal reader. I mean, I know that about you and I really, really respect and admire that. So thanks so much for having me. Well, it's not work for me, it's fun, <laughs> so, so there. So I just wanna uh, start for the people who might not be familiar with your book. This is a journey to finally know Anne-Marie's mother as well as the heartbreaking loss of her mother's immense cap capacities. It explores how humor and compassion grow belatedly between a mother and daughter who don't much like each other all the while navigating the stress and family decisions brought on by a parent with dementia. As long as I know you is a personal map to find a mother who may have been there all along, only to lose her again at the time of COVID. And I wondered if you want to add anything to that short little blurb? Well, um, no, I think the blurb actually says what the book is about. It's the journey of my mother and I uh, because we were not, as it indicates, we were not good friends. We had a pretty volatile relationship. And while we were, as adults, civil to each other, um, I think you can understand that in a even in a loving family, sometimes you have these, these uh, moments of difficulty. And we were often at loggerheads. We were a very different kind of people, even though we, we I think, wanted to love each other and wanted to like each other, but it, it, it was really troublesome. So the story is the story that after my father dies, which often happens, we realized her frailties and, and where she was in terms of um, some early dementia and began the slow and difficult journey to find each other. And mm -hmm. that, that is really the story. That's, it's the story of a, a kind of reclamation of a lost mother-daughter relationship. So thanks for asking that. So give us some background on yourself. How did you become a writer? And did you know you always wanted to be a writer? You know, I um, grew up on a farm. Uh, you know, I write rural. Rural Michigan is always going to be the place, the background in, in my work that sense of rurality is always a part of my thinking. But I was a misfit on that farm that I grew up on. I, I you know, I, this was a Oceana County small farm, working farm. It's now a, a large, very successful agribusiness. But at the time I was a child, I was a misfit in that world. And I knew I would have to find my way eventually somewhere else. And for a while, I even thought I was going to be a, a, a nun, and <laughs> if, that, if that makes sense. And so um, I was always enjoyed scribbling. And I became a teacher, and I became a teacher of literature. But it was the way language works that always attracted me. And I feel like I always had that sort of creative need. And so when my first marriage failed, that's a time of real assessment. And I remember thinking and asking myself, what is it that you really want to do? And although I loved teaching and there were plenty of rewards there, the creative work, the truly creative work was in language and in the way I, I appreciated language and, and the sort of way I could mold it. And so that's when I really start started working toward the writer, writerly part of, of that world. And in that sense, I was a very late bloomer. I came to this in my 30s. And so I hope that's affirming to <laughs> other people who are interested in that, in that work. And um, my first book was not published until my early 50s. So that whole 20 years was a training period that normally comes earlier for people. <laughs> but I did all the things that people do. I, I found teachers, I went to conferences, I took classes, I started to train myself as a writer. 
so that I could figure out, even if I never got published, I would be able to be skilled, or at least I would I would have some grasp of the real work of being a writer. And so that was the beginning. Great. Well, um, I was trying to figure out how many books in all you've written, four memoirs, two that you were an editor, two poetry, one nonfiction, several anthologies, seven plays, or is it eight? I'm not sure. Seven, yeah. Um, seven. And so how many does that make in total? <laughs> Um, I, I, I think I'm on, I'm working on my ninth book now. Okay. So, okay. so I think, and, and I, again, I just feel so very fortunate to have had these experiences with, with the books. I would write anyway, but I'm so grateful for a readership. It's been, well, a and, and the readers are grateful that we have that opportunity, certainly. Um, so a lot of times, uh, the audience will, will like to know, you know, what's your writing process? Do you get up at 5 a.m. every day? And tell us about your think house. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my writing process is really messy. I'm easily distracted. I am a restless thinker. Um, I learned early on because I was teaching and I had to support myself for quite a long time. I learned early on to work in surges. I am not the kind of person who can get up early and work before work. I, I am, I, I, and I admire that, but that's, that's not me. I carved out time, usually Saturday and Sunday mornings to work. I carved out time during um, holiday breaks. I learned to make um, mini retreats for myself to get away, to go to a different place where I could be inspired and work quietly. And the, so the surge effect what I call a surge effect is the way I, I work. And that had to work for me. And it has become a kind of natural way for me to work. I Even now, I have volunteer work that I do. I have family commitments, even though I'm semi-retired. And I feel like that uh, was a, a, a practical discovery that was also kin to my natural impulses to work like that. Many writers are much more disciplined than I am and work steadily every day. I do write something every day, but they write, you know, they have a greater, more cohesive plan. You know? <laughs> so how did you get the idea for this book? And how did you decide on the structure or the style? Oh, thanks for asking that question. Uh, this book came out of, um, of course, the first notes for it came out of the practical need to track my mother's care. It was just that practical need to, okay, I've got to keep track. This is where she is now. Here are her meds. This is what the nurses said. This is what the doctors said, because there's so much uh, complicated stuff in elder care that it was really hard for me to keep it all track of it all. And also I was trying to communicate with my family. My sister was also sharing care. So there was an immense amount of communication that had to go on and I just found it practical to write things down. But as I was doing that, I realized I was also in this state I would call now uh, anticipatory grief. Mm -hmm. My mother was in her late eighties, early nineties when all of this was occurring. And I knew you know, at time was shorter rather than longer. And I, for that reason, I knew I had to pay attention. And I had in my mind, there might be, oh, maybe there's some essays here because I can feel us changing and that might be interesting for people to read about. So I was also taking notes, recording some conversations as, as she um, began to, uh, not tell me things so much because she didn't do that but as as she be there were funny moments you know <laughs> like like there was this moment where she's studying my face she's studying my face and I'm looking at her going okay what is she gonna say now what and she looks at me and she says this is my 90 year old mom she says you have a lot of wrinkles and <laughs> And I thought, okay, that's one I, I know that's going to pop up somewhere. So those kinds of things became relevant. They they mm -hmm. became part of a, a potential document that would be more than just documenting her care. And I so I saw that 
through anticipatory grief. I knew this would be hard and I would want to say something about it that would be meaningful, I, that would make meaning. What did the idea of using the tea leaves, the tea leaves reading come about? Was that partly you trying to read her face too or? Oh, that relates to the structure. I find structure is one of the hardest things. And one of the ways that I can enter structure is if I find a good metaphor. And the, the tea leaf collection, the collection of that ironstone plateware that she kept began to resonate with me as, a, as an anchoring point to explore her life. I knew at some point I was going to have to do background information on her, but how to make it interesting, how to not just make it and then, and then, and then she did this. Mm -hmm. So when I came to packing up the house, that whole process, and looking at that tea leaf, and I began to study the tea leaf, I really had that moment of saying, oh, this is also a divination. Mm -hmm. This is also a way of prophecy. And the metaphor just unfolded from that. It was an amazing sort of discovery. And then, of course, to discover that the tea leaf pattern is not a tea leaf at all. It's a strawberry leaf at the end. Gave me that turn that kept happening. So structurally, that metaphor kept opening. And there are several in the book that work that way. Um, the chapter Flowers. Mm -hmm. also works that way where it was a way of dividing and working through narrative summary very quickly uh hard um there's another chapter um burning a uh, uh, garage sale blues where we burned her papers afterwards stylistically that uses a lot of poetic devices anaphora and and i was, was really proud of that chapter worked hard on that one mm -hmm. some good pages there <laughs> So those are the things that as a writer, you start to look for and address as you are trying to make a book be more, both more creative and more accessible to your readers. Mm -hmm. um, how would you define this work? I know you've written about your mother before, especially in Love, Sex and 4-H, but um, it's more than just a memoir. How would you define it? Well, I think this is creative nonfiction, and I also think this is um, a, a living, dying journey. It's a quest story in a way that many of the other um, memoirs that I've written are not. This is very definitely a, a quest. It's a journey. It's me trying to find her, her trying to understand me, maybe for the first time, and uh, because of that anticipatory grief, realizing we don't have a lot of time and the time is going to be marred by dementia. So we have, if we're going to do something, something is going to change. It's going to have to happen now. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of energy around this moment. And I think that was part of the inspiration. What are your favorite pieces in the book? And um, also tell us about the, where the title came from. That is so interesting. Oh, well, the title first, and then I'll tell you some of the other favorite pieces. That is a, that is a chapter that I so, um, I'm so grateful was kind of given to me. I had been reading Atul Gawande's book on being mortal. And in that book, he discusses how he um, came to this idea that it's not just keeping people alive, it's not just keeping them safe, which is what everybody wants to do. It's also that whole issue of quality of life. And his father was in deep decline and he asked his father, what makes life worth living? And his father said, if I can sit in my recliner, eat ice cream and watch a football game, life is still worth living. And Atul Gawande encourages people to ask this of their elders or their people who may be in compromised health, health situations. And so I finally worked up the nerve because my mother did not like to talk about death. I finally worked up the nerve to, to ask her this. And I expected her to scold me. But the first thing she said was, as long as I know you. And I had to check her on that. And she was, that's what she meant. As long as I know you, you kids, in other words, knowing people 
-hmm. being able to recognize them to say their names was what made her life worth living. And that just changed everything for me. That was a totally unexpected answer. And it's one that made me sort of reconsider all of the things that I had assumed about her. Right. And as time went on, too, you had to reconsider that that might not be exactly, she doesn't exactly know you, who you are every time. Right. Right. What does it mean then when she doesn't know us? Mm -hmm. And that was, thank you. That was a huge um, moment that comes at the end of the book when we're thinking, I'm trying to think about what is the value of life and how, and then of course, COVID comes in and throws the monkey wrench in everything. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. tell us about some of your favorite parts of the book, some of your favorite pieces. And I have a few myself. <laughs> oh, I'd love to know those. Um, my favorite, well, for it depends. For humor, for the fun part, I just loved writing the chapter on eggs, you know, on the chickens and the eggs. I, I could not believe this conversation was happening with these ladies. And it was so funny. And I just was so grateful for that that moment of comic relief because the, the book has a dark arc and um, I felt that was fun. And for depth of style, I liked, as I mentioned earlier, post-garage sale blues. I think the stylistically, the language there is is um, is laden. It, it carries a certain rhythm and a momentum. For structure, I really love the flowers chapter. I was so happy once again to find the metaphor for that because it's narrative summary. I had to move through all that court, the legal stuff really fast and somehow keep it interesting. And so that was a metaphorical chapter that I really enjoy. But I think for just human tenderness, the, and again, it's a gift chapter. It's something I stumbled on. The chapter named Anne and Elizabeth, where I watched that two other mother daughters interact in that state of dementia and what they did for each other, particularly what the daughter did for her mother, mm -hmm. is one of my. Um, I still, when I'm thinking about that moment in memory, it still touches me. I feel like that was such a powerful model for me to suddenly realize, oh, it might not be about who I am. It might be about me identifying for her who she is mm -hmm. or a daughter identifying for a parent who they are. I, I thought that was an astonishing gift. Mm -hmm. There were so many, I mean, the whole book was touching. Um, and I'm just thinking of some of these, the little parts that I thought were really touching, like bringing her McDonald's and making sure you had a tablecloth, you know, uh, to serve it on, you know, doing her nails and bringing that dog to her that just didn't want to get off her lap. That was, that was so sweet. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for those. I'm so glad you liked those chapters. I think... Um, the the one of the original titles, at least for one section of the book, was McDonald's at the Manor, and and uh, of course you can't use those names, those words, so that went away. But uh, it was a, a tradition or ritual. She, I think, because she was a farm wife and she cooked so much, that first fast food that came along, she just loved it. It was her favorite <laughs> food. <laughs> So, you know, there's humor, there's these touching things, and there's also a lot of sadness with the, the whole COVID thing, you know, mm -hmm. whoever would have thought what an impact that had on our lives. Yes, I agree. And it was not the way we wanted things to end with her. I mean, she mm -hmm. was alone. And that was just the absolute worst thing that that any of us could imagine. But what I am acutely aware of is my our family's situation was not in any way um exclusive we we were not isolated there were thousands literally thousands mm -hmm. of human beings and families struggling with the same situation yeah. Yeah. it was really appalling so what did it mean to have this book selected as a michigan notable book well, as I started, I am so grateful for this program. I just think it is a gift for both writers and readers and libraries. But the, 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 for the core as a writer, I think it's affirmation. It is a way of saying, 
uh, the your book your work is seen um it's a way of almost saying you're a grown up now you know mm-hmm. there's a there's a kind of uh, i don't know a little initiation to it that feels oh my gosh i'm it's seen the work is valued and <clears throat> i can enter um not that it's an exclusive in any way but that i can enter into this world with um a little with my head held up mm-hmm. and that's that's so powerful to give that to writers it's just uh a gift that i, I keep saying that word but it feels like that to me it's it's one one of those um rites of passage that i I think allows us to feel a little more confident and and you know we are so happy as readers that you touch on 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 michigan is so important in your work too oh yeah it it really is you know especially you know the rural countryside and the rural life um for the audience that doesn't know you've won four previous michigan notable books pulling down the barn in 2005 the house of fields in 2007 elemental a collection of michigan creative nonfiction in 2019 and also that same year the lake michigan uh, mermaid with linda nemick foster so um, i am so grateful for that all of that you know the other thing that i want to say about michigan notable books that's really important and we sometimes overlook is it's a way to give back to readers because the program funds the visits to libraries and that has been uh, really rewarding but also i just feel like what a what a win win to to allow writers to go into these libraries and i have had some of the most fabulous experiences i don't know if i told you when i was in muskegon they did a little um english tea we all oh. sat down for English tea to talk about the book. It was just delightful. Oh. So things like that, I, mm-hmm. I think, are wonderful ways to connect. So, yeah, this year you did the Fremont Area District Library, the Leelanau Township Library in Northport, the one that you just mentioned, Norton Shores, which is part of the Muskegon uh, right. library, uh, branch, and then uh, Boyne District uh, Library up right. in Boyne City. And right. so what kind of questions and comments did you get? Um, I, I love your essay in Elemental about uh, that Michigan Notable book tour where you go to Beaver Island and uh, I'm trying to think what else, Indian River maybe right. and a couple other right. places. Right. But yeah. uh, some of the questions and comments you got, you know, were so interesting. Any this year? Well, the, the interesting thing about this year was that <clears throat> one of the things that really came to the surface was universally people who attended are concerned about elder care. We are a generation of boomers moving through uh, the you know the population, the demographic of this particular time in the country, and most all of us are dealing with elder care in some form or another, and almost all of us are dealing with the frustrations, the the bureaucracy uh, behind it, the the concerns about um, our caregivers, whether we are doing the caregiving or we are, um, as we had to, finding places where our elders can be safe. Mm -hmm. I think I have so much respect for those people who are trained caregivers. I think they should have the most outstanding training. I think they should be well benefited, well paid. They are taking care. They are doing a task that is critical to families, and it allows families to continue to be contributing citizens. Mm-hmm. If any of us in our family had had to quit our jobs, we then are out of the out of the work loop, and that jeopardizes our families. It jeopardizes, um, you know, all the surrounding. Um, what do you call it, financial ecosphere of Mm -hmm. it. So uh, I think that having good elder care is one of the things that that has been a trigger to conversation about the book. Mm -hmm. The other thing that has happened over and over again is people, it's like I just say, tell me about your parents or tell me about the people you are caregiving for. And it's like opening a floodgate. People are so eager to talk about it, and it has also made me realize how important those conversations are. 
and how much we learn from each other just by sharing and just plain how much we need to share. Right. So the book has been a trigger for those conversations. And I'm, I think that's uh, been a learning curve for me, but I've also been really, again, grateful to, to have that experience. There was another book on this 2023 list, Wade Rouse's book, A Magic Season, A Son's Story, which is kind of a, a bookend of mother and father. He talks about his father's deteriorating health right. and, and he didn't have a good relationship, much, probably much worse than your you and your mother. But um, that was really interesting. I wonder if you had a chance to look at that. I have not read that one. My husband read that one. I, I, I'm uh, halfway through Burn the Place right now, which I think is remarkable. Um, I read We Kept Our Towns Going, which I think yes. I this book should have a play written about it. It should, I don't know what's going to happen with it, but I hope they're doing something with it. And um, and next on the list is this one. So oh, yes. It's Hard yes. Being You, which I think yes. is really another tender, in this case, a, a, a generational story, which, that, isn't it amazing? Those are all, I mean, the the generational idea the generational thread through our culture is so critical and these books reflect it i think that's beautiful well great that you read my mind i was going to ask you what you were reading next well <laughs> i just really answered that yeah. so. and i also i also read you know i read ann patchett and anthony door a lot and i um just read less which won the um, Pulitzer a little, uh, a couple years ago, I think 2017 or 18. And those books are important, but like you said, to read a Michigan book brings you in connection with the whole region. And, and, you know, whether it's a Detroit book or, a, or a upper peninsula book, it doesn't matter. You can start, you start to get a feeling for the state, which is complex, Yes, but also, and I think it's marked by complexity, but also that richness that that complexity brings. I think it's really important. Well, I want to thank you for your time and all your your work and um, your enthusiasm for Michigan notable books. And we hope that we'll hear from more books from you in the near future. So oh, thank, thank you, you once again, Anne Marie Uman, for her twenty twenty three book, As Long As I Know You, the mom book. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. It's a pleasure.